Well, it's usually pretty easy to introduce our guests here on Bellingham Voices, but today's guest has done so many different things. It's challenging, if not impossible, to describe him in just a few words. So, Brian Griffin, introduce yourself. Oh, my. Well, Deb, um, my name is Brian Griffin. Yes. And I was born in Bellingham in 1932, and I've lived here all of my life. And uh, with the exception of a couple of years in college, four years in college, and a couple of years in the Army. So uh, Bellingham is my home. So describe what Bellingham was like growing up as a young boy. Well, surprisingly, it, it looked very much like it looks today. The streets were the same, and uh, maybe that's why our traffic is getting difficult. The streets <laughs> were built for uh, a population of 30,000 people, and now we've got 100. Um, and it smells better than it used to. The, the pulp mill used to blast off every Saturday, I think, a terrible odor of sulfur and that would make your throat burn and, uh, and your eyes water. Uh, so it smells better, but Bellingham was then a, a mill town, sawmills, pulp paper mill, a logging town, um, a fishing town. Fishing fleet was far greater yeah. in size. Mm -hmm. So, um, and the cultural level was, was far lower than it is today. Mm. We have a remarkable cultural level today, it seems to me. Yeah, we do. You do. Um, so you went to the only high school in town at the time. Bellingham High School yeah. was the only one. Yeah. But you also went to an interesting school, kindergarten through ninth grade. Talk well, about that, that a little bit. Well, that was the campus school. Western Washington University used to be called the Bellingham Normal School. And a normal school, is uh, sole mission was to train teachers. So it was a teacher's college. Oh. And teachers have to have students to practice on. <laughs> so they had a, 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 a complete grade school from oh. kindergarten through the ninth grade. Okay. And I had went all those years there <laughs> and uh, somehow survived. It was, uh, hopefully I got a reasonably good education. And, uh, and then you went to Bellingham High School, which is the same building same that it building. is today, right? Yeah. And... Your senior year, uh, well, I you was were... elected student body president. Mm -hmm. So that was a great experience for a kid. Do you think that started your desire for public service? Well, maybe not the desire. My father had always probably inculcated me there. He was uh, always in. He was in the chamber of commerce and president of the campfire girl council and. Uh, he was into public service, and that's where I got the, the belief that one should do that. But I surely, being student body president, sure helped in the go in, in uh, learning to speak publicly and sure. giving you confidence in groups and that sort of thing. Okay. Great experience. From Bellingham High School, you went to Whitman. Whitman College in, in Walla, Walla, Walla Walla. Washington, and you graduated with a... I was a, a English lit major. Yeah. Not a very good student, um, but I learned to drink beer and had a lot of fun. <laughs> and I survived academically and got a got a diploma, which was uh, in doubt a time or two. At any rate, Whitman College was a good experience too. Hmm. And after Whitman, you didn't come straight back to Bellingham, right? No, the Korean War was going on, hmm. and. Um, the draft was going to get all of us. So most of my classmates volunteered for the draft just to get it over with. We probably, I probably would have been drafted five or six months later and I, let's, let's go get it, yeah. uh, get it done. Yeah. So I, uh, I was attended basic training in Fort Ord in California and, and somehow got selected to go to the counterintelligence corps school in baltimore somehow got selected that's but that wasn't random well i you know <laughs> i have no idea either. wow so but i was lucky to get there yeah although most of my classmates and friends um ended up being clerk typists and were sent to europe okay. where they married and uh, had you know they brought their wives over and 
And I was sent to Korea where you couldn't do that. My wife still is angry about that. <laughs> so you're in Korea. You're, in all intents and purposes, a spy. Well, I guess so, yes. I, I was in the Incheon field office, uh, which was the, um, the abandoned villa overlooking Incheon Harbor that had been occupied by the Japanese provincial governor and built for him. So we lived in a pretty neat place. Wow. There were 12 of us all. Nine of us were college boys. One officer, one warrant officer, and one sergeant. And the rest of us were just college boy special agents in the, in the uh, counterintelligence corps. We were all sent over there with a badge. Uh, we didn't sh have rank. We just wore little bronze U.S.'s. So people thought we were officers. We were saluted all the time. I was a buck private. Uh, but we were, we were issued a badge and a snub-nosed Colt revolver. <laughs> it was kind of cool. Wow. So my job was to spy on the Syngman Rhee government to find out what they were up to. Syngman Rhee was the South Korean dictator who and he always wanted to move his army north and reattack North Korea and restart the war. And uh, the U.S. Army wouldn't give him enough gasoline to, to run his trucks or his tanks. No, wow. And uh, anyway, my job was to find out what Syngman Rhee was up to. And I had five informants that I uh, would meet with weekly and give ask them questions, give them a task, give them a mission, and then the next week I would pay them, depending on how good their information was. And we paid them with cigarettes and whiskey. <laughs> Cartons of cigarettes and whiskey. <laughs> Crazy. But that was better than, the money wasn't any good in those days. Sure. They'd, they'd take the cigarettes and whiskey to the black market and sell them and do very well. Were you ever in danger? Were you ever in trouble? Um, well, one of my jobs was, was I was also checking on the local labor unions that were working for the government, and one of their leaders was a notable tough, Kim Kil Young was his name, and uh, I was taking movies of, of a labor meeting through the, through the uh, opening of my Jeep, and the Kim Kil Young saw me and came, came up to chat. And I was a little nervous at that point, but we got along fine. Wow. But at another point, uh, uh, Marie was running for president. There was a presidential election, and, and his opponent, strangely enough, was assassinated. And, uh, of course, she had blamed everything on the North Koreans, even though the, we are pretty sure Marie did it. So uh, I was asked to accompany uh, a number of South Korean agents uh, dropping the, their agents off on islands up towards the north, towards the DMZ. And when we got to the final island, it was just dusk, and we were approaching a little village on, a, uh, on this boat, on this LST, and all of a sudden, tracers, machine gun bullets, <gasps> started right over our heads. We were being driven off. We didn't know whether the North Koreans had taken the island or whether it was the South Koreans just warning us off. As it worked out, it was the latter, and I wasn't really in danger. At least they did. Good thing they didn't lower the, the guns any because yeah. tracers <laughs> about five feet over your head make you nervous. Yeah. We hit the deck pretty fast. Yeah, I bet. But I bet. No, no, no real danger. So after that, in, you're in Korea. Did you ever think, of, you came back to Bellingham, but did you think about going anywhere else, traveling the world or seeing other things? Well, I had traveled the world. I wanted to get home. I was engaged always, to be married. Always a girl. Always a girl. <laughs> and she's still with me. Her name is Maria. Yes. How many years married? 63. Congratulations. Thank you. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. So that started your professional career in insurance, correct? Well, my father had long been an insurance agent in Bellingham. His office was in the medical building. Do you know where that is? I don't know where the medical building is. The medical is. building, uh, the building that the greenhouse is in. Okay. 
It used to be called the medical building. And where the greenhouse is, the owl drugstore, the big owl drugstore occupied that space. It was and, the medical building. And a lot of, there were a lot of doctors there. <laughs> yes, of course. Of course. And over the years, that business has evolved as well, that insurance company. Yes. Um, my father and I did business together for 10 years. And then in 19, well, less than 10, then in 1970, uh, we merged with Larry Johansson of Johansson Insurance and, and uh, Orville Garrett and Fred Schott of Sorensen and Garrett, two other friendly competitors that we respected and knew we could get along with. And we, we uh, moved to the Unity Group, or excuse me, Unity Street building, mm -hmm. uh, where we did business as Griffin, Garrett, Johansson, and Schott. That's a mouthful. Sounds like a lawyer's office. Yes, it does. <laughs> but then it did turn into the Unity Group, right? And then uh, maybe 10 years later, we bought Ireland and Bellinger, mm. another uh, a large insurance agency, the, and merged them with us. And we thought it might be wise to uh, include that history. And so we changed the name to the Unity Group on Unity Street unifying large insurance agents. And we operated, uh, well, we were still the Unity Group when I retired. But uh, recently, maybe six or seven years ago, the Unity Group was sold to a large international insurance agency called HUB, H-U-B. And they occupy the same location on Unity Street today. Okay. So while you have this great career in insurance, you're also doing a lot of public service. Your, your influence is everywhere around uh, Bellingham. So let's, let's talk about a few of these projects that you were instrumental with. Let's talk about the parkade. Yeah, okay. Well, um, that got me in a lot of trouble with my partners because we lost a little business over that project. Uh-oh. I, uh, I was on the uh, Civil Affairs Committee of the Chamber of Commerce and we didn't do much, and I was pretty bored. And <laughs> the year end came, and Nick Lidstone, who was the leader of the chamber, the director of the chamber at the time, asked me to be to take to be the chairman the next year. And I said, "Well, Nick, I don't want to bother. You don't it, that committee doesn't do anything." And and uh, he says, "Well, what should it do?" And at that period, it was the, we were beginning to be concerned about um, uh, shopping malls mm. that were being built all over the country and destroying downtowns. Yes. And local businessmen were anticipating that might happen here. So I said, "We need a park. We need a we need a big parking garage downtown." Yeah. And uh, and I'll take the job of chairman of your committee, if that's all we do. He said, okay. So I, I lined up Al Levin of Levin's Furniture and Joe Hilton of Hilton's Shoes. And we, together we put together a group and we influenced the city council and urged a reluctant mayor to d get involved and, and um, and we ended up building the parkade, tearing down two thirds of a block on Commercial Street. Uh, my my barber, who's long but long gone now, used to be a, was in one of those buildings that we tore down. Oh no! He wouldn't speak to me thereafter. <laughs> but uh, he'd we, still cut your hair. We no no, no he didn't <laughs> want to see me. We lost a little business. Sure. Uh, and and the was, parkade then is the same parkade that we see today. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that was my first major effort in community activities. And from that seemingly impossible task at the time, yeah. I, I learned that if you really believe in something, uh, you can do most anything. You can do most anything. Well, add to your list. I mean, there's so many things no. that you've contributed over the years. Boulevard Park is here because of you. No, but my role, uh, my role in Boulevard Park was, was an idea role, not too active a role. I was, I was, I'm a member of the Rotary Club, 
that really made it happen. Bob Moles was the chairman of, of the group that made it happen. Uh, Jim Fickle worked on it for years and years and years and did most of the legwork. But I did have an important role. Initially, the whole idea started to save the views of the bay from the roadway, from State Street and the boulevard. And, and uh, I, Rotary decided that they would take on the project of building a park along the road, high up. It had nothing to do with the water. And, one, and so after we'd made that decision, one day I drove down there and I stopped and got out of my car and looked down over the hill and watched the log trucks dumping logs into the water down there. And all of a sudden it dawned on me, hey, we could, we could expand this idea to include the water. And finally, Bellingham could get to its waterfront. And so I wrote a letter to the chairman of the committee and made a presentation to the committee and everybody thought that was a great idea and we included that in the in the plan and made it happen. So now because of you, we can park on State Street and walk down to the park. Well, or then, then I guess because of my idea, there's a, there's a park to walk down to, yeah. the water. Yes, the waterfront. waterfront. So yeah. I, I, I'll take credit for that part of it. Okay, okay. Depot Market Square, Oof. that was your baby. That was a big project. Yeah. Well, I partnered there with, with, uh, with a friend, Rick Wright, and once again, it started with a rotary project. We were looking for a rotary project, and Rick and I went to, a, and the city um, had been granted a million dollars to improve that block on Railroad Avenue, and they hired a Seattle architect to, uh, and he designed a plan that was, um, that included a couple of little shelters for the farmer's market. The farmer's market had been held on that vacant lot owned by the city for a number of years. Mm -hmm. So we, Rick and I went to the meeting where the architect displayed his wares and his plan. And You didn't like it. Nobody <laughs> liked it. It was terrible. The farmer's market people were upset. Uh, I can remember one of them walked out of the meeting and slamming, slammed the door. Really? And Rick and I walked away saying, we don't want to touch that one with a 10-foot pole. <laughs> right. But that night I lay awake thinking about a wonderful market that I'd seen in Chartres, France. A public market, uh, well, a, a, park, a parking lot during the week. And then we walked through it on a following Saturday and it was this marvelous French market. And in the center of it was a glass building, a glass and steel building that uh, had, they'd been parking cars in, now it was where all the meat and cheese was. And it was just terrific. So I kept thinking, I was, I was thinking of that. And Rick was laying awake the same night, remembering that David Morse had told him about the railroad station that used to be on that lot. So Rick and I got together the next day and shared our ideas and thought, wow, let's build that French market that looks like a railroad station. Yeah and honor the history and make a great market area. So we went to see the mayor, Mark Osmondson. And uh, I I'd, I'd painted a little picture of my market vision. We, I, we laid it out on the table and we told him our, of our idea. And, and I remember saying, Mark, you're gonna waste a million dollars if you do it the way that Seattle architect wanted to do it. And we showed him our plan and he slammed his fist on the table and said, by God, you're right, we'll do it. And we agreed to raise half a million dollars. And then he said, oh, but you know, it's gonna take us forever getting a new architect. We gotta go through the city project. It'll take three months to, to mm -hmm. get an architect going on that. So I said, not a problem. We'll pay for the architect with the money we hadn't raised yet. Right, right. So I went down that afternoon and hired John Stewart. And we started immediately. And whew, that was a big project. Took a lot of, a lot of, well, we 
there were some exciting times, like we had it all designed and then the, the contractor who was demolishing the Highway 99 bridge over the Skagit River contacted our architect and said, hey, I got all this beautiful iron for you. And we changed the whole idea. And, and uh, so that all those beautiful girders in that market building are the old Skagit bridge, or the old Highway 99 bridge did not know that. over the Skagit River. That is a great story. But it, it wasn't quite that easy. Yeah. yeah. I can tell you're telling the story and you're just like, you're just reliving the exhaustion <laughs> of the project. <laughs> well, it was a great fun project and I'm so pleased that we did it and Rick and I are very proud of it. And um, As you should be. It took a couple of years. Yeah. Of, and, we would, and we did raise a half million bucks. And, Through uh, Rotary? No, that Rotary was didn't have you? anything to do with it. Okay. Well, they okay. contributed okay. some money, hmm. a little, you know, $20,000 or something like that. Hmm. No, money came from the craziest places. It was just amazing. The community really saw the vision and wanted to do it, and, hmm. it, and uh, hmm. it's been a great success. So over the years, uh, with your public service, there seems to be an emphasis on or an extra passion about downtown Bellingham. Why is that? Well, probably my old-fashioned ideas having grown up here. Um, uh, well, I think the down, downtown Bellingham is a lovely place. We have a remarkably nicely weighed, laid out downtown. And, uh, you know, and it, it, fortunately, despite them all, it's evolving and uh, it's surviving and changing. Mm. So it isn't the retail center anymore, but amusingly, neither is the mall. That's true. It, the world changes, changes constant. Yeah, yeah. And I understand you were instrumental in the trees downtown Valley. Uh, well, Ken Hertz was the mayor. Uh, he was the mayor that turned Bellingham around. Um, Ken Hertz was the mayor and violently opposed to the mall. He wanted to build a mall in the downtown. I became the chairman of a new organization of downtown people to help him. And, um, and we had a developer who was going to build a mall in the downtown, in fact. Um, and we wanted to improve the streets and build and plant trees. Can you imagine Bellingham without trees in the downtown? No. Well, there, no. there never were any trees until the mid-70s when we, uh, and one of my jobs it was to, the trees and the bollards and the bulge corners and all new sidewalks were paid for by a local improvement district, which is paid for by the property owners, really an additional tax that they must agree to. Mm -hmm. A majority must agree to. And I was able to convince enough of the, the majority of the downtown property owners to increase their tax to pay for all that. So whew, that was an effort too. <laughs> Lost a little business over that one too. I bet. My I partners bet. kept saying, Griffin, what are you doing here? You Cut that out. Oh well. So in addition to a successful career uh, in the insurance industry and a very varied career in public service. You also have a lot of other interests. I mean, you're, you're kind of a Renaissance man, aren't you? I'm an old man. That, <laughs> that helps. If you live long enough and your health is good, you can do lots of things. Tell me about so, the Orchard Mason Bees. Let me tell you about Fair Haven Village Green. Oh, oh that, it's, you want to talk about that one too? Sure. because that's Is that a, another feather in your cap? It is. Okay. Chuck Robinson came to Village Books, came to me one day and said, we, do, we don't have any public restrooms in Bellingham, in Fairhaven. And he wanted me to take on a project to develop that little city-owned park piece of land uh, with a public restroom. And I wasn't very really excited about build, building toilets for merchants, but, <laughs> but I, once again I remembered the neat little parks that I'd seen in Paris and many cities in Europe where a small little park, a neighborhood park, can make a huge difference in livability. So I decided, so I accepted the challenge and we, and we, um, 
We convinced the city to get involved and we raised uh, $450,000 and, and uh, had Dirty Dan Harris cast as a, <laughs> as a statue and we, we got that all done. So Fairhaven Village Green is one of my really favorite projects. How does it make you feel seeing these things, seeing the market come to life every Saturday, oh. seeing the Fairhaven Green being utilized, the Village it, Green being utilized? It, it kind of nurtures my, my, civic, my sense of civic roots. You know, I've lived here all my life and I, I can f kind of feel the roots. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> so those are all fertilizer for the roots. <laughs> That's good. Uh. That's good. Okay, so let's get to some of your other interests. Well, like you talked about the bees. The bees. Um, well, years ago, like 25, I planted a 40-tree Belgian fence along 16th Street on my, where we lived and um, of apples. And I wasn't getting very good pollination and I, a friend of mine sent me a little brochure from Washington State University about orchard mason bees. And I recognized that I had seen little black bees occasionally on the blossoms. And so I followed the directions. I simply drilled holes in blocks of wood and put them up on my, on my garden house. And that very afternoon, uh, I had three little female bees laying eggs in holes. And that fascinated me. And I contacted a, um, uh, an entomologist from the uh, federal entomologist for the, the USDA in Logan, Utah, who had studied uh, this bee for 20 years and written papers. And, and he was so generous, uh, he sent me everything he knew. And I, and I was really hooked. I was fascinated. They're fun to watch, and they, and they don't sting you, and they're, amazing, and they're terrific pollinators. So for a couple of years, I developed more and more. I, I got about a uh, seven times increase each year. In pretty apples. soon I had, yep. in numbers, per, and pretty soon I had bountiful apple crops and far more bees than I knew what to do with. So one fall, I, I sliced up a bunch of those wooden blocks that the nest that they were laying their eggs in and hibernating in, and attached them to a kind of a cute little house with 12 empty holes, and put a little hang tag with a, explaining what they were, and gave them to friends for Christmas. And people were fascinated. And the next spring I was getting phone calls, they were working and people were, were intrigued. So I thought, gee, maybe here's an economic opportunity. And by that time I had even more bees. So I made a whole bunch of them and went to, a, to the Seattle Garden Show, talked to people for five days. I met one person who'd ever heard of a mason bee. But I came home with $2,000 in my pocket <laughs> and I was selling these things for $15 a piece. I was sold a ton of them, and that started it. And it, then I, well, driving home, I was exhausted. I couldn't talk. I'd talk so long, and but I was exhilarated. And I thought, wait a minute, you're an old English major. Write a book about these bees. So uh, that was my first book, and the book still sells. I don't really know how many. It was self-published, and so I don't really know how many of I've have been sold, but it's something like 40,000. And they still sell on Amazon, 1,000 a year. I sell them to, uh, well, the book has been very successful. Well, and that's not your only book. You've written quite a few books a few over others, the years. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I, so as a result of the bee thing yeah. taking off, I was invited to attend the bee course put on by the American Museum of Natural History in a wonderful lab setting in the mountains of Arizona where we trapped, we caught bees every morning and spent the afternoon in the lab with microscopes trying to identify them. <laughs> Fascinating. I learned a lot about bees. 
And I got fascinated with bumblebees, so I wrote a book about bumblebees. Of course you did. Humblebee, bumblebee. <laughs> Humblebee is what the English used to call it. So. In addition to all of that, I mean, the list just keeps going on and on. We could talk for hours about you and your oh, yeah. life and what you've done. You uh, volunteer at the museum. Yeah. You're the history, the one of the local history buffs that people go to. Well, I narrate the Sunset History Cruise right? for the museum and have for 11 years now. Yep, yep. And that's fun. But your big passion now, correct me if I'm wrong, but you have a shop that you create... You make ukuleles, and how did that start? How did that begin? Well, believe it or not, I, I, I had a ukulele in high school. Oh. And, uh, but it didn't last beyond my senior year. I took it along on the senior prom, and my date sat on it. <laughs> that was, that was. <laughs> really? That was the end, yeah, really. That was the end of the ukulele. <laughs> Uh, it was also the end of the relationship. Right, and then, right. No, not really. She still lives in down here, and I okay. once in a while I run into her on the street, and I never fail to remind her of that. <laughs> we laugh about it. Anyway. I hope so. Uh, I was given a little ukulele years and years and years later, and my wife and I started going to Maui every winter, and and I get a little bored sitting on the beach over there, so I took the ukulele along that I hadn't been using and took it into the Lahaina music store to have the guy give me a lesson. And I was playing a little soprano, and he was playing a, a lovely big tenor ukulele, and I lusted after his tenor, but he wanted $900 for it, and I thought ukuleles cost 25 bucks, so I didn't buy it. But I did find online a company in Honolulu that sells a plan and a workbook, a how-to book. And so I bought that for $25, and I came home to my workshop and built a ukulele, and it was pretty good. And now I'm working on my 128th. Crazy. That is crazy. You brought one with you. Yeah. Can you pull it out and can we can we look at it and uh, I just happen to we, have can we you this just is one twenty five I promise I won't sit on it <laughs> so this is a tenor ukulele yeah I won't let you no no and you made this yeah and this is sycamore wood when where do you get that from well I have a friend a, a luthier friend in Pennsylvania who sends me sycamore and I send him. Cedar okay. and maple, our local woods. Uh -huh. So, so this is uh, strangely enough. I now sell them for not twenty-five dollars. I sell them for a thousand dollars. I guess that's inflation. That is, yeah, yeah. So, How long does it take you to make one? Well, I'm making one just like this for a man named Stuart Fuchs, who is a nationally known ukulele teacher and, uh, and, and performer. And I, 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 people always ask me that, and I've never known. But I've been keeping close count. And I've got, I'm going to string it up this afternoon, meaning put it, I've, the bridge is now, the glue on the bridge is now setting, and I'll be putting the strings on it later today. And uh, I will have 40, 46 hours in it and 20 days. Wow. So. Wow. Do you have a favorite one? Um, yeah. This is one of them. Yeah. I really like this, this wood combination. This is Western... Red cedar, and uh, and the sycamore, and then sycamore. Uh, but I have another. The, one of the fun parts of making ukuleles is using the different kinds of woods, and listening to the sounds that you get, and mm. you get different different sounds with each kind of wood. Mm. But this is uh, this is pretty good. And, it, and it's been great fun, too, because, well, I've been making ukuleles and learning to play them for 12 years now, I guess. And I've made all kinds of wonderful friends. And uh, 
I have a group of three other folks who come every Wednesday to my home at 3.30 and we play the ukulele for an hour and a half and then we drink a little wine and then we all go out to dinner together. Oh, that sounds lovely. And, and I also play with a little group that plays in nursing homes. Uh, about once a month we go to one of the assisted living places and play and that's Con lots of fun. Continuing so, your public service. Well, it's just a good excuse to get out and play. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, I checked your website for the ukulele. It's griffinukuleles.com. Right. The blog is amazing. You, oh. you, you're posting a lot of pictures about the process, and it's, it's fascinating. Thank well, you thank for sharing you. that. Well, people seem to enjoy it. Yeah. And it's very easy to do, and I enjoy writing it. And, you know, I just carry that silly iPhone in my pocket, and yep. when I get to... Uh, point where I think that might be interesting for people, I'd take a picture. And it's all pretty easy to do. Thank you for sharing. Again, that's griffinukuleles.com, plural. Yep. Brian, thank you for spending so much time with us today. You're My pleasure. You're a fascinating person. Thank you for all of your contributions to Bellingham as well. Thank you. It's been lovely. Thank you, Brian Griffin. And we'll see you next time on Bellingham Voices. Did we spend a half an hour? You want to play us out? Hmm? <laughs> yeah. Uh, what am I going to play? Uh, I went down south to see my sows in Colorado.